Stephen Raymer, curator of the Pavic Museum of Broadcasting in Minneapolis, Minnesota, has just pushed play on a tape recorder on the museum floor. From that tape recorder, you are hearing Ella Fitzgerald as she performed in 1948. The recording is being played back from the original tape on the tape recorder which created it. The tape recorder has strange markings on it. The commands say spiel, halt, and octone. This modern sounding tape recorder is no ordinary machine. It was manufactured in Germany in 1938. It's called a magnetophone, an invention that changed how people communicate. One day after the war ended, Mullen was in Germany with a member of the British Signal Corps inspecting German broadcast facilities. From an interview in 1998, Mullen tells what happened that day in May 1945. And uh, within a half hour or so, I was in this little town called Bad Nauheim. The Radio Frankfurt operation had moved out to this town because of the bombings in Frankfurt. And so this is where their studios were. And so it was under control of army officers, but the staff was, were German and they were operating the whole thing. And uh, I went in and uh, saw the officer and I asked him if he had these tape machines that they used on the air and he said, oh yes. And I said, could I hear one of them? And he said, okay. So he took me in and sat me down in a room and he clapped his hands a couple of times or something. And a, a German uh, attendant came and clicked his heels and went off and put on a roll of tape on this machine in the back room and I, all I heard was a loudspeaker in front of me and I couldn't believe it. I'd never heard anything like that in my life before. This was the great revolution as far as I was concerned. Mullen had heard a state-of-the-art magnetophone. The magnetophone was a product of the German company AEG, which was owned in part by the American corporation General Electric. According to Dr. Michael Beale, professor of radio and television at Moorhead State University in Kentucky, General Electric had inspected the magnetophone before the war. And it's a Model K2, which I happen to own. Uh, the machine that I have, we believe, was sent by AEG, uh, which was the company that manufactured it, uh, to General Electric in Schenectady uh, around 1937 to do an investigation and to do a report on it. And GE's report was not very flattering, to tell you the truth. The, the tape recorder was still fairly crude back then. Like many GIs, Jack Mullen wanted to claim a war souvenir. And Mullen knew the value of what he had found. As soon as the war was over and we were about to come home, we had a lot of these things laying around, and I thought, well, uh, as souvenirs of war, I can't think of anything nicer for me than a pair of these machines. Just the mechanisms now, mind you, that was all. I didn't care about electronics because I could make that up when I got home. And that's what I did. But of course, I needed tape too. And there were a number of uh, rolls of this stuff laying around that had been sent in. And I picked up every one of those that I could. And on two occasions, I went down to Nuremberg once and I went to, uh, I can't remember, Frankfurt or Stuttgart or something. And I stopped in there and I asked them if they could uh, slipped me two or three of these rolls, and by the time I was finished, I had 50 rolls of this tape. So I sent home 50 rolls, and I sent the two machines home, and when I got home to San Francisco, I got out of the taxi that took me home from the train station and um, rang the doorbell, and my mother came. The first thing she says is, my God, you're bald. And the second thing uh, I said is, uh, how many packages came here? And she said something like 18, which is what it was. Mullen was not the only GI who was interested in the magnetophone. Dr. Beale says there were others who saw the value of the invention. But Mullen was not the only one who uh, brought back machines. Uh, Colonel Ranger brought back two machines and developed a company by himself, a company to make uh, the tape recorders, the Ranger Tone. And in addition to that, uh, there was a man by the name of J. Herbert Orr who sent home some machines and also was able to uh, uh, get the formulas from Fritz Flaumer of BASF, uh, the formulas to manufacture tape. So there were a lot of people that had sort of rediscovered the, uh, the tape recorder. Uh, however, 
just because Jack Mullen didn't know that the tape recorder existed didn't mean that other people didn't know that the tape recorder existed. It wasn't a complete secret. But there were powerful inducements to be first with the tape recorder. At the end of the war, patents held by the defeated countries were voided. And once again, Jack Mullen was at the right place at the right time. He, when he came back to the United States, he reassembled the machines and started using them and uh, and improved on them and was able to interest some investors, including Bing Crosby, into uh, putting money into developing the machines and was able to interest the Ampex company, which had been in business during the war uh, but needed now a uh, peacetime-related product to make, uh, interest that he was able to interest the Ampex company into uh, developing the tape recorder. Where the blue of the night meets the goal of the day. Bing Crosby was a well-known radio star in the 1940s. Crosby was a perfectionist who disliked performing live. This meant that Crosby's shows were often recorded on transcription discs. Mullins magnetophones were just what Crosby needed because the tape recorder offered the ability to edit out mistakes. The basic real difference in the early magnetophone, the early tape recorder, was the ease of editing. It was possible to edit recordings on disc. This was something which had been done by Armed Forces Radio throughout the war. But it was a difficult process. It was very time-consuming, and it required re-recording. It required a generational sound quality loss every time you had to make a copy of a copy. There was a loss, and that kind of editing required making copies. Here you could cut the original tape and have the same sound quality as the original master tape, except now you have an edited version of it. At Crosby's urging, the U.S. company Ampex developed an American version of the magnetophone. Jack Mullen describes the first Ampex tape recorder and talks about its implications. This is the first model of the Ampex 200, which even today, uh, I uh, don't think anybody will deny what I've always said about it as the most beautiful tape recorder ever made. It's like a piece of furniture with black lacquered cabinet, and even the electronics is good looking. The top is stainless steel, and it performs, you won't hear it here, but it runs and performs as well as the magnetophone, as that called. So this is the machine that put Crosby on tape. And so with the introduction of this Model 200 Ampex tape recorder, which occurred in April of 1948, the whole recording industry went through a vast transformation. And the results are something like this, where it opened the field to a vast uh, a floodgate of new equipment, all based on magnetic recording. Georgia. Besides working with Bing Crosby Enterprises, Mullen spent 28 years at the 3M Company. Mullen worked on the creation of videotape, again based on the original structure of the magnetophone. Jack Mullen died in 1999 at the age of 85. Magnetophones and the first Ampex 200 tape recorder can be seen and heard today at the Pavic Museum of Broadcasting in Minneapolis. And the machines sound as wonderful today as they did in the 1940s. For Common Ground, I'm Ken Mills. Ooh.